Um, the premise of the assignment, it was based off the assignment Dr. Arbin gave for his um, neuroscience for architecture class at New School of Architecture and Design, where I study. Um, so, as previously, as Michael just mentioned, um, he talked about HM and his episodic memory loss, and to me, at that time, it's something clicked where um, there was a connection between him and the neuroscientist and writer Oliver Sachs, who suffered from prosopagnosia, face blindness, um, and my uncle, who looks like the Dalai Lama, who suffered from Alzheimer's disease. Um, so I, for my project on how architecture and neuroscience connect, I wanted to explore how these three conditions um, affect your memory and how to wayfind and um, recognize spaces, since they all seem to have difficulties. So the first is episodic memory loss. Um, so as Michael previously mentioned, um, HM suffered from epileptic seizures, and at 27 he had a temporal lobectomy, um, where most of his hippocampus was removed, and um, just to stop the seizure activities from continuing throughout his brain. Uh, the frequency of the seizures are reduced by approximately 70 to 80 percent, um, and it's now understood that the procedure is conduct if it's conducted in the dominant hemisphere, um, there are negative effects to memory and language. Um, so immediately, HM experienced memory loss. Um, so for the next 55 years, HM participated in numerous experiments regarding his condition. Um, like, my, like Michael mentioned, he was able to learn um, new procedural memories, but no. So Dr. Susan Corkin, um, she heavily studied HM. Um, she conducted fMRIs and learned that HM had several lesions to the neutral uh, temporal cortex and the amygdala, as well as uh, his hippocampus. And Dr. William Peter Scoville and Dr. Brenda Milner studied HM and ate schizophrenic. Um, patients who had the same lobectomy and learned that the amount of hippocampus removed is directly related to the amount of memory loss. Um, from this, we also learned that the hippocampus is responsible for converting short-term memory into long-term memory. Um, so in 1978, O'Keefe and Nadal tested um, HM's ability to recognize images and navigate through a map. Um, as you can see on the image on the left, he was, HM was able to recognize that that was a face. Um, but then when he was asked to create a direct path from start to finish, he wasn't able to do so, um, no matter how many times he took this test. Um, so O'Keefe and Nadal uh, concluded <coughs> that the hippocampus is also responsible for constructing cognitive maps, and this would explain HM's inability to formulate Um, however, in Corkin's study in 2002 of HM, she um, discovered that HM was able to draw a very detailed cognitive map of his home, which he moved into five years after his surgery. Um, so it's believed that the parahippocampus gyrus is responsible for spatial processing, which is different from um, cognitive mapping. Um, so the next condition is prosopagnosia. Um, as mentioned, it is commonly known as face blindness, but in addition to face blindness, um, you can't recognize buildings, you have an inability to do so, so landmarks aren't necessarily landmarks. Um, and it is caused by damage to the fusiform gyrus, the inferior occipital areas, uh, which is vital for face perception, uh, the anterior temporal cortex, which is responsible for the integration of information in the parahippocampus campal cortexes. There are two types of prosopagnosia. There's um, acquired prosopagnosia, which occurs when there's a stroke or an accident. Um, so you kind of still remember what a face is supposed to look like. Um, but then there's also developmental prosopagnosia, which is genetic in nature. So you have absolutely no idea what a face is supposed to look like. Um, so similar to HM, there is a famous case of FG. He's a 70-year-old man, and they studied um, constant rebuild of 
University of Montreal conducted a study who looked at FG and five men um, with healthy brains, no prosopagnosia, um, all averaging between 22.2 years old. Um, they were asked to identify 20 famous monuments through pictures and then asked to identify 20 famous monuments through verbal description. Um, with this first part of the test, uh, H, uh, FG was only able to identify four of the 20 monuments um, through pictures, but then he was able to identify 17 out of 20 monuments through a verbal description. Um, then FG and the five men were asked to copy the route of a familiar town. He was, uh, they were taken to the town from point A to point B in this very specific way. Um, and they were able to hit, they had to hit 21 uh, decision-making points, and they were able to write down notes, um, and they were requested to verbally speak their thoughts. Uh, and then they were also <coughs> taken to, the second part of the test was a similar study, um, but instead of a familiar town, it was an unfamiliar town. So, let's see. part of the test in the familiar town, FG only made one mistake, um, but he relied heavily on his notes of street names. In the second test, he, um, all the participants did well, but FG didn't do as well. He was only able to make 10 out of the 21 decisions, and you can see in the arrows all the wrong decisions he made. Um, the average control group, the average number of mistakes the control group made was 2.2 mistakes. Um, so FG um, also had notes on street names and he could not rely on any of them. And at every marking point, he was very hesitant. So uh, the study suggests that even with the correct um, decisions, it could have been based off of probability. Um, so the third. The physical space and the private therapy, uh, even though the patient response was quite extraordinary, it was very nice in terms of therapy. Uh, and uh, um, we especially uh, wanted to bring the idea of pleasure and celebration, celebrating recovery from illness into, uh, into uh, the, the mental health of the patient. Um, I was bringing this into. Uh, Another set of uh, uh, another scale of work. This is the house of Ian Tay in uh, um, Chopin in New York. He said he designed in 1955, and it's in a sterling uh, metal, uh, a bar suspended on a, on a podium uh, in the festival from uh, from uh, the first time from the time of the You don't really know where it is, but I mean it's floating. It's there is, a, there is a, an outer space uh, and an inner space, and uh, essentially it's very intelligible, it's very linear, it's very clean, it's very, uh, very simple. Um, and at the same time, it's been there for 60 some years, and uh, I say it's 99, and, and it's not in great shape, but it's still uh, with us. And uh, it's been living there for quite a long time. Um, another case uh, uh, with Haven South in Berkeley. Uh, he was there till he was 98. Uh, he lived there over 60 years. Uh, and I, I, I'm not saying that this is the only vehicle for longevity. Certainly, there, there is genes, there is diet, there's all sorts of things. But I'm saying the contributing factor. Just like we can we can uh, uh, rationally uh, understand that, that there are environmental factors that decreases the quality of your personal experience, uh, exposure to noise. Uh, some environmental factors are easier to, to quantify, but at the same time, so we're talking about how the, the idea of being of inhabiting an integrated work of art can uh, uh, can extend your uh, life cycle. And obviously, the, the last other two Johnson, Steve Johnson is uh, monumentally rich. I just want to remind everybody, but you know, <laughs> it, it, the most uh, uh, the richest man in England died at 64 just two months ago. So wealth by itself.
uh, Jewish filmmaker, a professional photographer from Los Angeles, uh, uh, lived uh, in the Soriana house for the previous 90 days. And so let's keep going with this path. Uh, Jerry Sultan was uh, uh, the, one of the uh, first collaborators uh, of the Soviet Jay after uh, World War II. And he recalls this uh, particular episode. Imagine my amazement when during an argument with Prabhu after the final presentation of the Ten Years of Jay project, he turned to me and said, Ne mon cher Sultan, we call this love God. It, it has to be beautiful. So this is a man that is routinely assigned to form for instruction, uh, that is a hyper-rationalist. Uh, wait a minute, it has to be beautiful. So the idea that beauty has to be part of the e equation of architecture, because we can come up with all sorts of principles, but architecture has always form, has always extension, and uh, a very famous sentence by by uh, uh, Louis Tard was that uh, we start from the immeasurable, uh, we get into the measurable through quantified uh, in drawings that we have in sessions that we go back into the immeasurable. But no, it doesn't, I'm not saying that every piece of architecture has to do that, but there's a possibility of that immeasurable to be reached upon. And I, and I do believe that at the level of your own house, uh, you can't have that without having necessarily a, a, a work of art. So, so uh, three case study, is Olsen House. Uh, yes, it was John Olsen. He's in Berkeley. Uh, Ellen Olsen just turned 100. Uh, incredibly sharp. All the marbles all together. Um, area is uh, listed 130,000 square feet. It was completed in 54 and occupied since 1954. So this is the house. Uh, it, it, I am a lot, uh, I live in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. California has uh, a tremendous amount in, in its uh, hyperbolic growth, a tremendous amount of mobility in Poly, and uh, uh, you could uh, appear and disappear in three days uh, from the Ten Ten site. Uh, so it's the fact that someone would stick around 60 years on the same block when you when you don't have to, and when the house is not that big, and you could have a much bigger house, uh, at least it could be factored in why people stick around to those places. So uh, this house is, is a glass house, very French tilt, uh, there's a tremendous amount of privacy because you cannot really see anything from the street. Uh, there are uh, obviously um, uh, curtains uh, there. Uh, the Olsons were married for 71 years. Uh, his bride and passed away two, uh, two years ago. This is when they first got married. And this is, uh, 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 this is, uh, and this is uh, later in life. So this is the house, uh, it's a compound that, that was done. This is the Olsen house, it was designed by Tickhouse in 68, and later this, uh, this piece. And this is the same uh, uh, corner, uh, John Olsen with his son, who's almost 70 now, and uh, 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 John Olsen with his wife in here, this is the Tick House. So it's, a, it's a, an environment that is, uh, is fully immersive, it's about surrounded by nature. Uh, the, the plan is extremely simple, we're gonna get into this. Um, essentially, this transparency, this uh, ability to connect to, to your environment, uh, plenty of light. Uh, uh, by California standards, this is a in completely inaccessible house. I mean, uh, Ellen Olsen has to go up and down the stairs, so she's 100, and so she can sit there. So, uh, more of this particular kind of experience. And so, this is the plan. So, we have, uh, okay, so we arrive at a very steep uh, uh, ramp. Uh, you park the car in here, you enter the center of the house, uh, and uh, second floor, a uh, uh, big uh, um, living room. Is, uh, this is the, uh, the early iteration had a deck, which is when they extended the glass line outside, just so it's completely enclosed, uh, a little balcony outside. But essentially there's no circulation space, it's extremely clear, it's extremely intelligent, it's extremely efficient. Uh, and there is light permeating into the core of the building. So this is uh, uh, the space as, as it is now. And so this is the original plan. And the house is a, a, is a regular, uh, it's quite iconic uh, for the space. It's definitely not what you see in Berkeley, which is uh, you know, largely chambers and big rooms, especially after sea rains, we've been flooded by uh, uh, sheds and, and shingles, but uh, there have been differences uh, in all sorts of this stuff. You know. And so this is a house, this is not a house, it's not a functional house. I mean, this is a place where people live in, that they, you, you can have your ice cream and, and, and use your mat. Uh, uh, 
then also we do the Apollo, the study of the Apollo proper. Uh, then you work with CERN and uh, do Alvarado and Salum and Hulco. And uh, so this is a house where the kids were getting and uh, people come all the time. And it's a bit like a, a transporting place for heaven. And so this is heaven. And everything was well considered. I take great joy and great pleasure. I feel very contented and very happy to be in this house. I'm sitting here right now and I'm looking at the peristyle and I see the trees. I can see there. I can see there pointing me to different directions. The idea that you can see things from the sky. Sometimes I walk around late in, uh, in the night and I have moonlight coming in and I walk down the corner and I see Mr. Moon looking at me. So uh, this is beyond the first order of the fiction where you just make the sandwich and stuff like that. I mean, there is a, there is a circularity of, uh, of emotional reinforcement in here. This is home. This is home. I grow in the beauty of it because it's more than a shell, but more than shelter. So I don't know what to say. Walter Grotius, art is a field of interest common to everyone as beauty is a basic requirement for civilized life. Its education neglects the discipline which forms uh, its emotional uh, habits, its, its breed, its three personalities. This is an unpublished uh, uh, speech that he gave at the opening of the Hollow Rite of Center in 1953. This is Walter Grotius, this is the founder of the Bauhaus. Walter Grotius is the, 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 the first people, the person to make sure form for soul function, but he actually talks about beauty, he talks about emotions. So, uh, maybe it's the historians and, and, and the people that have, do not have access to fully understand the, 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 the emotional universe of the people that we, we, we put on the uh, on trial that uh, uh, are really we're missing. I mean, it, ultimately, these are men that were reacting to the 19th century city. This was a city of squatter, a city that needed to be uh, uh, reorganized uh, because of what was spread over in the city. So the Bullock House by Billy Johnson, Ottoman Circular Mora 92, Death for New York, uh, from the other or the Garden of Sea, completed in 1946, uh, occupied since 1954 with she. This is the first house that Billy Johnson ever designed, coming out of Hollywood. Uh, is the Circular Mora was married to Robert Amora, who was one of the greatest orchestral photographers of the 20th century. He was uh, a the favorite photographer of Walter Grotius. <coughs> say that uh, Damor is not a particularly wealthy family. <coughs> they bought this house uh, 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 for very little money. This is where Damor uh, used to do his own obsessive projects, which later in his career became an architect. And uh, this is how the house is today. Um, you know, pretty much uh, the, the same as it was. Everything has been changed. Great relationship with uh, the indoor outdoor. Uh, the internal of a relationship on the East Coast is uh, just as prominent, it's just a, a different kind of experience because uh, of something that uh, I, uh, that I, I realized myself.